Hi everyone, I'm Neil Sharp from the Stress Management Society and once again it's Stress Awareness Month. We are now on our 30th year of Stress Awareness Month. It's been going since April 1992 and it's an opportunity for us to, to recognize and discuss issues around stress, mental and emotional health and what we can do about it. Our theme this year is that of community. Now, we've been around for a long time, and one of the things that I've observed happening over the period of time that we've been in existence is the degradation of community. In fact, there's research stemming, stemming back to the 60s that shows as we've experienced this degradation of community, there's been a rise in mental health issues and sadly suicidality. Now, this is also quite unique to our weird countries. Weird, if you've never come across the acronym, stands for Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich and Democratic Countries. Main cause of death for a man under the age of 45 in a weird country is sadly suicide. It's rapidly also becoming the same for 15 to 29 year olds. Now that's a shocking statistic, but as we continue to develop these societies that are highly individualized, where people are feeling disconnected, isolated, this issue is only going to get worse, not better. But because there's so much stigma and shame and guilt associated with the issue around mental health, I don't think we're doing anywhere near enough to tackle it. And that's why I'm so pleased that Stress Awareness Month gives us an opportunity to ensure we have an open dialogue, that we've got a safe space to start discussing these issues, which often aren't easy or comfortable. And today, I am overjoyed that I've got two incredible people with me. We're going to get into this and have a deeper discussion around why this is important and what we can do about it. So, who do we have with me today? I've got the author of this wonderful book, Yes, You Can Talk About Mental Health at Work, and here's why, and how to do it really well. I've got Melissa Doman. Uh, she's joining us all the way from the States. Um, it's a real pleasure to have her with us. And we've got Beat Stress at Work. Um, by Mark Simmons, How to Balance Your Ambition with Your Anxiety definitely use some of that myself and as many of you may know I've written a book a few years ago called the 10 step stress solution so I'd like to think I'm not sure about experts we're definitely three witnesses three people have had a life experience which would give us a good opportunity and a, hopefully a good understanding of the issue we're here to discuss and, and potentially explore some solutions so that's from me I'd like to give our wonderful guests and opportunity to introduce themselves. So um, Mel, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, so I am an organizational psychologist and former clinical mental health therapist and author. The core of what I do is helping businesses around the world and leaders and individuals to constructively and realistically talk about mental health at work. And so I wrote the book because I truly felt someone had to. Uh, my clients range from really large organizations like Estee Lauder and Janssen and Salesforce, all the way down to small companies and everything in between. And what I've noticed in my work, not only as a clinician, but then going into org psych, is people have been desperate to get permission to have these conversations and to know how to do it well. And the reason that I got to this point now to write this book is because back when I was in clinical, something that all of my patients shared is that none of them felt safe to talk about this in the workplace. And that really didn't sit well with me. I felt like I was treating people in a broken system and a broken narrative. So when I transitioned to working in org psych, I felt, let me make an impact at the source. And I still do that traditional work, changing communication, team dynamics, conflict, helping people play nicely in the sand pit and share their toys that we call the workplace. But you still couldn't say the words mental health and mental illness and it just didn't sit right with me. So I subspecialized in that four years ago and it has been incredible to see how people are really behind this initiative. And the reason I wrote the book the way I did is because there's an amazing amount of information in the world to foster these sorts of discussions to help people understand what we're actually talking about. But what I felt was missing was an individual playbook. I wanted something all in one to show where we've come from. What are the obstacles? Where are we going wrong in how we're trying to deal with this? How do we address the hard parts 
how do you actually have the conversation, what to say, what not to say, why, and also real-time learnings of how the pandemic and global systemic racism has also influenced that conversation. There's plenty of data. There's plenty of business cases. There's plenty of every single business reason to have this conversation, but a book was needed for the individual of here is how you, no matter where you can sit in the organization, can start making an impact effective immediately and also steeped in reality. So I'm deeply appreciative that people say the book is easy to read and easy to use. So uh, I'm told that a, a spoonful of honesty helps the education go down. Oh, amazing. Thank, thank you, Mel. And it's it's interesting because there's been such a broad variety of issues that have impacted us over the last couple of years. I know obviously the, 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 the obvious one is the pandemic, but there have been so many that have created stress, trauma and anxiety. And, Extremely. And, 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 and absolutely, obviously, you've picked up the issues around sort of race and racial equality. And as we've been developing our sort of uh, approach to how we deal with diversity, inclusivity, equality, equity, uh, we've realized that actually there's a piece missing in the traditional approach. And for us, it's, it's adding the B, which is belonging, that sense mm -hmm. of belonging, which ultimately very much connects with our theme for Stress Awareness Month, which is community. Because often when we think about community, we think about people in a local geographic region, our neighbors, our family, our friends, but community could be your workplace, your country, or us as a global society. And that sense of belonging, which many of us are missing, which, as I said, when you're looking at sort of, um, sort of cultures in the non-weird countries, like you know, South Americans sort of shamanic cultures in the jungle or Papua New Guinea or in the Himalayas, and particularly as I was doing some uh, exploration around the, the, the blue zones in the world, I found that actually there are cultures around the world that have low to no instance of mental health issues. And that was shocking to think that it doesn't really exist for them. But what does exist is a strong reliance on their community to survive. You need the butcher, the baker, the fisherman, the guy that thatches roofs, the, you know, the tailor, the shoemaker, for you to flourish as society. Whereas for us, you don't find what you're looking for in ShopRite. You can go to any other store. Um, you know, if, you, if you go to Tesco's and they're out of lemons, you go to Sainsbury's or Waitrose. So we don't actually need to rely on our community or any one individual, which should be a good thing, but actually as human beings, we require that. So I think that there's something we can definitely come back to because a lot of the issue we're talking about, whether it be about mental health or diversity, does come down to the strength of our community and that sense of belonging. Absolutely. And I'm noticing Maslow's hierarchy of needs next to you. And uh, <laughs> I might have studied that a little bit in school. And, uh, you know, my training um, is from Adler University, and he was the first community psychologist. So what I love about his work is that he looks how people exist in systems, family, school, so on and so forth. And my undergrad was in sociology. So I feel like I'm, I look at the 20,000 foot view and then also from the individual and how those two things interact. So uh, you're just giving me an you know, excuse to geek out with you for an hour. Amazing. Looking forward to getting into that. But it's not just the two of us. We have the magical Mark Simmons with us as well. Uh, Mark, I had a chance to have a look at your book um, as well. I was, uh, I was fascinated with, with, with your approach. Um, I found that the two books were quite complimentary. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Mark. Yeah, thank you. It is Mark. It is Mark. Magical Mark, by the way. Magical Mark. <laughs> thank you so much for first of all inviting me along. You know, I've been, I think we've both been great looking forward to this event, haven't we, Mel, for the last sort of few weeks. So it's, it's great to be here. So um, I'm a bit different, I think, to, to Mel in terms of background. Um, insofar as I'm I'm basically my my main hustle is I'm a businessman who runs his own agency. So I, I'm a kind of a, a, a working professional who kind of runs a, a sort of a, a little company um, and have been doing that for most of my life. So I work in management training. Um, my, my side hustle, and it seems I'll come back to that, that expression in a second, but my side hustle is mental health. OK, so whereas I think Mel is, is your bona fide kind of like, you know, heavyweight mental health person, it's also <laughs> a, bit of, a bit of a side hustle as far as I'm concerned, um, because um, running alongside my, my business career has always been this sort of um, level of underlying anxiety and experience of stress 
And back in the day, that led to a severe sort of uh, breakdown, which eventually culminated in an attempt on my own life. So I've really been to sort of dark, dark places. And um, I think um, when I started to thinking about how I could help the world at large, I thought, well, if I can enjoy writing, which I do, why don't I write a book? about it so I because I reckon and what seems to be becoming more and more true is that I think there's quite a lot of people out there who are silently going through quite difficult experiences and are not prepared simply to, to open up I mean particularly talk about males and suicide let alone that I mean I think there's a whole bunch of people out there that are not if not close to suicide are at least going through kind of the mill a little bit in the workplace so I kind of feel that if I can be very open and honest about my experiences, it's going to help other people. So, the, so mental health has been historically my side hustle. But what's been interesting the last couple of years in the writing of the book is that everyone's uh, interest is much, much more in my side hustle than it is in my main hustle. So, uh, so it, it's, it's like knocking on an open door at the moment. And I really feel that from this moment on, I want to spend more and more of my time in this particular area. My, my link with Mel, just for everyone to be crystal clear, is that um, Mel is, um, feels a little bit like my, my mentor stroke, my professor stroke, my teacher, because the, at, at the very bottom of the book, you'll see Mel's name, um, because the foreword is by Melissa Doman. And uh, what she did so kindly, which I'm very, very grateful for, is she basically not just edited the book, but I think properly audited the book to make sure that everything I wrote there was correct. And the number of slapped wrists I got for simply not saying the right thing, no matter what- Doing so kindly, I'm kindly. Saying, I'm saying it very kindly. I, I say it from the bottom of my heart. We had a bit of a joke expression, but we call it tough love. So I got a lot, mm -hmm. plenty of tough love from Melissa, which made the book, in my view, probably sort of 50% better than what it, what it would have been. So thank you very much, oh. Melissa, publicly for that. So, yeah, so I'm basically oh. here almost at the beginning of a journey, because I know, Neil, how many years you've spent in this area. Melissa, I know how long you've spent. So I'm kind of a bit of a newbie here, trying to really to, to leave a bit of a mark in the mental health arena. Yeah. And I just want to talk a little bit about that because, yes, I've, I've, I've been in the, this field for coming on to 20 years now. It's 2003. Um, I've kind of had the opportunity to observe this field, this industry now, as I would describe it, growing yeah. and you know, being taken much more seriously at the early days, you'd be lucky if you'd be speaking to a low level HR advisor or a health and safety officer with, you know, kind of a tick box exercise. I spend much of my time now speaking at board level to some of the largest companies on the planet. But even though the conversation has escalated up the, the management chain or the societal chain, the scale of the problem has also escalated. Now, just to give some context to this, because we talk about mental health often people think we're talking about something that's a pick and fluffy it's like oh you know have some counseling or they're there it's going to be okay 14.3 percent of global deaths i'm talking the natural churn of human life 14.3 percent of the people that die every year and this is in 2019 i'm sure that number is much higher we don't have up-to-date data yet 14.3 percent of those people die as a result of their own hand as i've already established it's the main cause of death for a man under the age of 45 there are four times as many military personnel and vets in the US that die from suicide than from active combat. To give context, only 1% of human deaths are as a result of war and all human violence put together. So we are 14 times more likely to die as a result of our own hand than of any kind of human violence. Yet, even though it's such a big issue and the vast majority of people that die as a result of their own hand, sadly, often don't have underlying health conditions. They have the potential to have a full and fruitful life ahead of them, and typically are young people. In fact, those people are getting younger and younger year by year. Over the last few months, I've heard stories of children as young as seven, eight, and nine that are taking their own lives. Why am I so passionate about this? This is how I started my journey. My background isn't uh, uh, academic or uh, medical it is off the back of a first-hand experience in 2003 I had a breakdown and I attempted to end my own life so I kind of know what it's like to be in that situation and what's really strange is that even though I've been doing this work for a long time and I know a lot of people that I've heard stories with organizations and people we've been working with or people that have lost their lives 
other than my own direct first-hand experience, I've never had an experience with someone really close to me that had taken their own life. Shockingly, that changed about four weeks ago where one of my best friends in the whole world took his own life. Um, and this isn't my job. This is my ikigai. This is my reason for being. And one of the reasons that I'm here and I'm still doing this work with as much passion as I had when I first started is because this isn't getting any better. Our vision is to create a happier, healthier, more resilient world. We are further away from that goal today than we were when we came into existence. Mm -hmm. We want to create a world that doesn't need the stress management society. We are a nonprofit and NGO. We are trying to make ourselves redundant. And I'm really grateful that our warriors such as yourselves, Mark and Melissa, that are helping with this work because we are failing our most vulnerable members of our society, people that are struggling and suffering in silence. And the last two years has only made things worse. I can only hear so many stories before it starts keeping you awake at night. So how have we arrived at this point? where we, we literally have round-the-clock counters for cases and deaths of issues that are largely unlikely to impact a lot of healthy young people. Yet, even though it's robbing us of so many lives unnecessarily, forget cases and, and counters for deaths. We don't even talk about it. Why has the last two years been so challenging? And why is it that we are still, in 2022, unless it's someone high profile like Anthony Bourdain or Robin Williams, we still don't even talk about it. It doesn't even register a blip when we are losing young people unnecessarily. What are your thoughts on this? I'll, uh, I'll kick that, this off if that's all right with you, Mark. Oh, no, so yeah. um, first of all, I wanna say how, I can't even find the words to say how sorry I am that you lost your friend. I can't imagine that level of pain and I'm deeply appreciative that you're sharing it with us and with the people who will, will watch this because it touches everyone in so many ways that we don't expect. And also speaking as a former clinician, it is really quite frightening, just to give some background, how truly common suicidality is. So in each clinical sector that I worked in, for some reason, I had a disproportionate number of clients who were suicidal in comparison to my peers. I got very sadly used to taking people to the hospital, people who had multiple attempts under their belt. I didn't lose a single person, and I was deeply proud of that. And my exposure to that topic was even before I went into clinical, where my first semester of university, um, six students took their own lives. I knew four of them. And it is a very real and growing challenge. And when the pandemic occurred, we basically put kerosene on an already raging fire. So I look at humans as organisms in a large ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And we are incredibly resilient creatures, but only to a point. Things were not great even before the pandemic. The trajectory of stress levels and the pressure to perform or to win and all of these pressures that are on us, and on top of that, the growing division that was even occurring and lack of community prior to the pandemic, it was building and building and building. And then when the pandemic arrived, the pot boiled over. And what we're noticing now is very unfortunately that it's just too much. The data, as you well know, prior to the pandemic, was not heading in a good direction. And despite you know, more availability of resources than ever, people were feeling emotionally sicker than ever. And the pandemic has just, there's not even a word because not only is there a rise in um, chronic stress levels, which is a very slippery slope into developing a mental health condition if left unmanaged, but there's also people who don't even know how to feel happiness anymore. They don't know how to feel content. They forgot what those emotions feel like. And what's even more stressful is the ambiguous grief we're all feeling from mourning the life that was the good parts because it was taken from us without our consent. And so when you're consistently mourning the past and reaching back wistfully, it doesn't exactly do any favors for your mental health or your stress levels. Absolutely. And on top, on top of that, people have become so tribalized in how they deal with current world events. It's not just the pandemic, it's all the other Absolutely. 
events happening at the same time where the age of, of constructive public discourse seems to be a dying practice. And of ability to express ourselves, to open up and speak freely, particularly if you are questioning the accepted narrative, whether that's about mask, no mask, vaccine, no vaccine. Whatever it is. It yeah. doesn't matter the issue, you know, Republican, Democrat, Brexit, Remain. Yeah. And that in itself, for me, I found stressful because I have questions and I want to... It's very adversarial. Yeah, I want to debate things, but we are in the cancel culture age where you say the wrong yeah. thing yeah. and you will be cancelled and you'll be a conspiracy theorist. And I think that, coupled with the fact that the tools that many of us would use to uh, deal with mental and emotional challenges, like go to the gym, go on vacation, go to the movies, go hang out with your friends. There were periods in time you couldn't even do that. So people that were already struggling that may have had coping mechanisms through social activities or sports activities or whatever else, all of a sudden were able to do that or even like have the reprieve of just a vacation. Mm -hmm. And even now we can do that, the amount of people that are still scared to return to that normal level of society, for me, is really, really troubling. What have you found, Mark? Well, if I can step back, I mean, there's a, a dozen things here, which I, I really hope we have three hours for this conversation, but I know we don't. <laughs> so in that context, let's be try and make it a little, little bit sharper than that, is that, you know, we, we've talked about the thorny issue of suicide. And I'm, I'm also like, not very sorry for your friend, Neil. Uh, and for yourself uh, around that. I know how awful that must be. But I think just if we step down one, I mean, the other figures that we currently have are that kind of like 50% of all work-related illness is down to stress, anxiety, and depression, okay? So that's that's not suicide, but that's kind of lower level kind of uh, feelings. And I just wonder whether, you know, if we want to really push things home, there's obviously a really big human factor about that. But what about the financial factor about that? So if you're trying to basically persuade a hardened business person about why it's such a bad thing, why not talk about the financial implications of that number? So that, that's just throwing it out there, because you know what? That might get people's attention, number one. Well, the other thing uh, is that... Let me just, sorry, let me, just go on that point. Before yeah, you go, yeah. and I, I've got these numbers because I spend my life talking about these numbers. In the US, depression cost $51 billion yeah. in 2019. That sounds yeah. low to me. Yeah, and that, that's, a, that's, a, 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 that's reported. That's mm -hmm. uh, you know, reported. Obviously, there's a lot mm -hmm. of it that goes un unreported. In Europe, 600 billion euros in 2020. Yeah. That's 4% of GDP. The estimates are by 2030, it will cost the global economy $6 trillion mm. in, in, in mental health. Now, $6 trillion is such a big number, people have no context of how big a number that no. is. To count to $6 trillion, it would take 190,200 years, the lifespan of humanity. That's how big a number it is. Yeah. Yet even though, it, just to, to add to your point around numbers, yes. There's pounds, shillings, pence, dollars, yeah. and euros value here with, through lost productivity, performance, staff attrition, accidents, injuries, fatalities. And when we start looking at it in that way, that obviously is where businesses yeah. do start but taking it, it seriously. Might, it might be the way to get people's attention. That's all I said. I mean, the obvious thing to say is, look, it's, there's a human cost here. It's just not the right thing to see somebody suffer. That's not right. But if that's not getting through, then try the old commercial argument, see if that gets through or not. To, to add on not? What, Sorry, go oh, on. just very briefly to add on to what Mark said, you know what I'm finding these days also, you know, this is bringing up the great resignation, yes. that what I'm finding businesses are most responding to, to the ones that I call the toe dippers, who are trying like, oh, do we want to talk about this? And I go, well, you have two choices you can go with the flow of history and how world of work is changing and this topic is not going away and you can be one of the odd ones out not talking about it and honestly your workforce will vote with their feet they will go work for employers who do talk about it and when i say that they immediately sit at attention i don't even talk about the numbers and the money i basically say say goodbye to your workforce they'll go work for people mm -hmm. that are doing the right thing and they go oh but I think, I think, I think oh, yeah. Melissa, one thing to say, I think it's um, now what I'm going to say now, it's not meant to be gratuitous or contentious, um, but it could well be that the pandemic 
has given us the kick up the bum that we need, really. Yes. To get things, and I mean that, um, I say, yes. I, I know how much suffering there's been, I, I get all that there. But you know what, I mean, now the more truth. than ever, um, in the last two years, with my, my, my main hustle, my job job, I have to send emails out to people about the need for creativity training. And I get these tumbleweed moments back of like, well, I'm not interested. You know, you send out a message now about mental health, written a book called Beat Stress at Work. It's like, we need that. We need that now. So, and I just think that it could well be that the last two years could be the best thing that happened for mental ill health. And the, the last I thing I said before I had a, is that, you know, I'm now on LinkedIn for the very first time trying to reach the mental health community. And I just didn't quite realize how many well-being managers, well-being directors, that departments that are out there that I never knew existed. So I do think we're at this kind of tipping point, which could be a good thing. No, that's an interesting point because I feel that, and, and it'd be really interesting to get your perspective on this, that to a degree we have become desensitized to, to human suffering because it's just so common that, oh, so-and-so's got depression or anxiety or you're hearing about someone that's taken their own life. It's kind of one of those things that, you know, we should be kind of downing tools and considering like, how do we take immediate action when you've got to the point where it's costing us so many young lives? Yes. And it's not like the information isn't out there. You, you know, if we were sitting here saying, you know, we've all written a book on how to deal with, 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 with being punched in the face. We're here having a conversation with how to be prepared to be punched in the face, how to deal with that, how to respond, how to recover from that. None of that still prepares you for actually being punched in the face. I've been doing this work for 20 years. I've, as, as, as Mel was sharing, you know, been around sort of situations where sadly people have taken their own lives or dealing with companies post an event on supporting the, uh, the, them with kind of the, tree from, uh, the, the, sorry, the grief and trauma response post a colleague taking their own life. But none of that actually prepares you for having that experience yourself. And no, you know, no. this is the first time in 20 years where I've had to deal with this myself. And it's like, you know, I could counsel anybody through that process, but until you've had that first hand experience, there, there, there is no rule book that prepares you for that. There is no amount of training that equips you for that. And this is where, sadly, more and more people are having that firsthand experience. Either, you know, they've had their own kind of experience with mental health or they know someone that's had kind of a, a traumatic or sadly a fatal experience. And obviously, like this sense of isolation and disconnection, this degradation of community that's happened over the last few years, which was happening long before the pandemic arrived anyway, has obviously led to a lot of people feeling this sense of isolation, of loneliness. Now, this was recognized back in 2018. We were involved with some research which was published. And off the back of that, the, the British government, for the first time in our history, employed a loneliness minister. Yes, that's actually correct. If you didn't know, Britain has a government minister responsible for loneliness. And it's absolute bullshit. It's a token gesture which has brought about very little value. Um, when you know, one of the things I found, and forgive me for being blunt, people in political positions work in four-year cycles. The world doesn't work in four-year cycles. You know, obviously, we're seeing this playing out to full effect when we've got countries like, say, Russia and China that don't work in four-year cycles because elections don't really exist. They can think of a 10, 20-year plan. In some ways, that's not good, given what's happened in, in Eastern Europe at the moment. But actually, in some ways, what if we were able to take a 10, 20-year plan for mental health, for physical health, for and the general well-being of the population. How would we approach things differently? And this is one of the concerns that I have. We haven't taken a long-term view to an issue which is having a serious long-term impact. So we've arrived at a point where many of us live in populous cities and countries where we are never alone. But more and more people are feeling lonely. Now, don't quote me on these exact numbers, but there was some research that I think originally started in the 60s or 70s. And they asked people, how many people can you trust implicitly? And again, don't quote me on these numbers, but when they first did it, people were saying six or seven people. And it got to, I think in 2015, it was like 1.75 people. I think currently it stands at less than one. I think it's like 0.75 people, which means that there are people out there that don't even have a single person they can turn to, trust and rely on. That for me is shocking given the fact there's 7 billion of us, there is no reason for anyone to feel lonely. So I guess the next thing I'd really like to explore as we kind of really start to understand this sense of community, why it's so important. How is it that, that, that this sense of isolation and loneliness that many of us are experiencing, which has only been exacerbated by the pandemic, 
how is this having an impact on people's stress and mental health? And why is this something really important for us to explore? Well, I, think- I mean, I mean, if I was, if I was just being a little bit, um, how do I say, not, and again, not controversial, but there is a demographic difference here, because if I take my younger son, Jack, who's a 23 year old, mm-hmm. th- that generation um, seemed to be an awful lot better about trying to sort of not become isolated. And I, th- they just seem to be talking more about their feelings. And in fact, just today, I was talking to um, a business colleague at a major consultancy firm, and she was saying that the people that feel lonely are the ones that are slightly older. So the kind of 40 plus year olds who are less prepared to talk about stuff within their communities. Whereas the people that are kind of feeling actually this is all right, I can talk about it, are the 23 year olds, 22 year olds who are seemingly much more, more uh, prepared to open up and talk about life and the universe and mental health and I've got a problem sort of thing there. So. And I'm not quite sure where that's come from. I don't know whether, Mel, you've got any experience in your area of the demographic differences between between, uh, people in terms of loneliness. Yeah, most definitely. So um, the thing I would say is it's quite understandable and it's it's frankly um, the easier thing to say that, you know, the, the younger folks, you know, we have how do I say this? Younger folks have access to more of a nomenclature. They were taught the power of naming emotions and were raised by generations that were trying to open up these discussions more. However, what I would say is what I've noticed in my work is that the willingness due to the pandemic to talk about the emotional impact of the last couple of years is across generations. And so Alternatively, I've, I've also seen that the loneliness that people are feeling is actually in the younger generations for a variety of reasons. So I'm so happy to hear that your son and his folks are, you know, opening these incredible conversations that gives me hope. You know, what I've been hearing from the younger generations is having direct conversations is harder, largely due to technology. So there are lots of ways to have, um, bless you, whoever that was. Then it doesn't mean, me. Um, And the thing is that because there's so many ways that people filter their communication these days, that when it comes to having these sorts of honest conversations, it get quite uncomfortable. So I'm finding that the isolation via technology, even though it it can make us connect across the planet, is serving to sometimes hamper these sorts of conversations instead of having these real authentic, present, sometimes uncomfortable conversations. But I am noticing that that loneliness factor is actually with the younger folks. I'm finding that older generations um, are actually really opening up about this because they feel that they will go pop if they don't even if they hadn't talked about it historically for example you know gen x or baby boomers etc uh but i'm finding that loneliness is in in the um the younger generations and this seems to be impacting across five generations at once and that's not to discount what you're saying mark it's just different stuff that i've seen and i think that you know you don't what we need to say, even if it makes folks feel uncomfortable, is important, even if it feels controversial. Uh, this is not meant to be sunshine and rainbows. It's supposed to be realistic and edgy and somewhere in between rainbows and dark depths, because that's what it is to be human. Uh, and listen, I, I agree that there, there are rainbows. I genuinely believe that we have the potential to create the world that John Lennon sang about in the song Imagine, if we want it enough. But here's the challenge. We don't want it enough. And, and that, that, again, sounds really challenging. There are so many things that keep us stuck in this current paradigm. Lots and, of factors. Yeah. And until we start waking up to, you know, our kind of innate potential, but also how we were designed, we are social creatures and we need the power of our community. And unity through community is literally the only way forward for us to save our humanity. And I think this is where the, where the challenge comes in because... Ultimately, we are living in a world that is increasingly encouraging us to be individualistic and operate as islands. It doesn't work and it doesn't bring joy. 
Mount Gaudat talks about the equation for happiness, where your life experience is equal to or greater than your expectations. So I say it again, your, your life experience is equal to or greater than your expectations. That is the, the, the formula of happiness. Most of us have such unrealistic expectations because of how other people's lives look on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok mm -hmm. and the rest of it. And often it doesn't marry up. So we're miserable because it's like, well, it should look like this. These people look like this. Why does my life look like this? And it's interesting. And Mark, I'm really glad to hear that your son is having a positive experience because, again, uh, you know, go, going back to Mel's point, the data doesn't support that. Sadly, the most at risk demographics are the younger people. That's where the significant bulk of these issues are, are, are getting to the point where, you, you, you know, it's creating massive cause of concern. And ultimately, we've also got to consider there are youths and children that have had their youth stolen from them over the last two years, that were not able to have their proms and their, their, their time with their friends or their spring breaks or, or you, you know, like the, the, the past of their childhood that never get back. If you're 30, 40 years of age, the last two years have been a percentage of your life. If you're six, seven, eight, 10, 12, you won't even remember what your life was like before this all started. This is the world that you live in. And I think this is really where it's very important we consider that there's a generation of youths and children that have had a collective generational global trauma as a result of this experience. We know, anyone that's worked in the therapeutic field will know that childhood trauma will implant and impact your behavior potentially for the rest of your life, unless there is a significant therapeutic intervention. I can't see any national or multinational therapeutic intervention taking place to help these children deal with the trauma that they've been through. To add on what you're saying, uh, again, speaking as a former clinician, the system is not currently equipped to handle this level of demand. And I know folks who are still in clinical practice, I cannot believe they haven't cracked yet. And so the lack of allocation of resources and removing obstacles is something that needs to be worked on because the current system cannot handle the rising demand. It couldn't handle the demand even before the pandemic. Of course. So this is, I think, talking to my next point is we are relying on a system that was never designed for this, wasn't really equipped for it, and it's far too quick to hand out superficial solutions in the form of pharmaceutical interventions. We know that there is a place for that, but it shouldn't be the first point of call. And actually we want to be able to reach people long before they get to the point where they need a significant pharmaceutical intervention. And this is coming back to the point around community because we thought long and hard about this as what is the true long-term antidote to this mental health uh, pandemic we're experiencing and looking at cultures around the world where they don't really have issues around mental health in the ways that we do in our developed technology-driven societies. What are the benefits of community when it comes to the management of, of, of stress, mental health, and poor well-being? Why is it important for us to have a network of people we can trust and rely on, friends, family, work colleagues? Why is it important for us in our workplaces to consider community-building activities? What are your thoughts on this? Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's... If it's interesting because you're kind of thinking whereas it's unlikely that we can solve the big macro problems so we're going to get pandemics we're going to get wars that's going to happen whether we like it or not it's a question of what we can do at a sort of more of a micro level to deal with things so if if you know i've had most of my lived experience in the workplace and what often happens is it, when you go into a company and you you're asked how do we change things not not linked to mental health i mean i mean linked to my job as a creativity trainer. I often say, I'll tell you what, let's not begin with the company. Let's not try to, don't blame the company because if my, if my boss was better than I, why don't you begin with the smallest unit that could do something about it? So why don't you begin with the team that you're working within? And if you happen to manage three or four people, why don't you begin there as the place to try to sort of put into place the kind of environment that's gonna support mental health? So I, I just wonder whether actually is that if we jump towards sort of solutions, do, do we try and focus on little small little units, small little agents of change where there's a better chance of success rather than, oh, if only my company did this better, we'd be OK, where that never goes anywhere. So I kind of always think start small, win with the few 
to win with the many, as a kind of a, the phrase goes. Well, as Michael Gravel taught us in the book, the tipping point, you don't need to reach everyone, you just need to reach a critical mass and it becomes the way we do things around yeah. it. Now, we've seen that play out in the negative. How can we flip that on its head? So what are your thoughts on that now? I couldn't agree more. And I think that one of the reasons that the system is not adapting as needed is not only because of the obstacles, but because in a lot of ways, when you zoom out to the 50,000 foot view, it feels too far gone to change. And so many people, they just kind of put, put their hands up and they're like, someone else will do it. You know, I clearly can't do this. And I completely agree with Mark that you have to start small where you can, where you're getting that cumulative effect. Mm. And also really having, and this, I realize that these words might be um, slightly counterintuitive to the theme to today, but to have that community connection, it takes individual responsibility to each person to contribute to that. And so I think there needs to be really uh, an increase in the call to action to every single person, as opposed to waiting for the system to serve them. Yeah. That's mm. not gonna work. And so, uh, yeah, so it really does take that individual accountability and responsibility to contribute to collective change. Whenever I do events with companies, I go, people can't hold just the CEO or the leaders responsible. Everyone is a chronologically aged adult and yeah. every person needs to do, notice I say chronological, not yeah. mental. Every person needs to do their part. You can't just hold leaders alone responsible you have to participate in creating that sense of community and helping to change the narrative and how we talk about this and it needs to happen everywhere as much as possible it's going to be an extremely slow burn and it's going to get to the point where not talking about it becomes not doing best practice so you got to do the little micro ecosystems to try to yes. shift the overall system yes. Yeah, absolutely. You can't do well-being to people or for people. It's a collective journey, and it only works exactly. through active participation. And mm -hmm. you, you, uh, you, Mel earlier you mentioned the kind of this this notion of tribalism, which I, I think in in our modern day vocabulary we see it as a negative. But actually, you know, throughout human history, we largely come from tribal cultures where there mm -hmm. is that sense of community with your tribe, um, and and. And you know, but as we progressed as a civilization, that would then grow into your region, your country. So that national level tribalism through religion, religious tribalism, uh, you know, people with shared values or beliefs. You know, in modern day way, do we see tribalism happening quite strongly is in sport. But it's more than just me good, you bad. This is more a sense of belonging, you know. If yeah, and I think it's a good point because actually, if you go back to the sporting thing, now you've got tribalism with the fan base, but you've also got tribalism within the teams. So if you take a sporting environment, to take a team, now in a team, everybody's got different roles. Of course, you, know, different, you get midfield, attacking, defense, but you also get people with different emotional roles. Like that person over there, he or she, they're the good listeners. That person there is very good at comforting. That person there is very good at encouraging, motivating. That, that all these things are emotional states that are good for well-being. And if you kind of know who is contributing which emotional role, then going back to your earlier question, Neil, that's what's going to create a really powerful ecosystem. Exactly. And this is where societies can thrive because we are relying on each other to play to our strengths. We are working together for the common good. We're standing shoulder to shoulder. And it's really interesting because, you know, particularly in, in, in uh, I, I live in London, I'm, I'm British, and, you know, I've seen it just, uh, you know, in my lifetime, how things have degraded, people are wholesale turning their back on things like religion, which would have been one of their main kind of sources of connection to something bigger. There was also kind of the, the pub where people would go for that sense of community. Those have gone out of fashion, uh, fast and you could say pint of bitter. Sport was still a strong one, particularly for men who obviously, as we've already established, are, are, are very much at risk for, for mental health issues and, 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 and sadly suicide. And that's one of the things that I notice, um, particularly here in, in, in UK. I used to live in, in, in New York, so I've kind of seen the, 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 the importance of sport in, in, uh, across the Atlantic as well. And it gave people a sense of connection, a sense of belonging. 
there is something extremely powerful about 65, 70, 75,000 fans singing the same song at the same time. It gives you a sense of like, I am a part of something. And yes, obviously we, there are some negative aspects to that where it can get toxic, but for the whole, for, for, the, for, for the most part, for me growing up, you know, religion in my house was football. Um, and it was, that was a strong connection I shared with my dad. And it was one of the few places that I would see my dad freely express his emotions. I'd never seen him shed a tear in normal daily life. But there were many times I saw him crying his eyes out at a, you know, a football game because we just got kicked out of a cup final or England had got thrown out of another tournament. And also another place where I see him shouting, nephing and blinding. And I'd never seen him raise a word in anger outside the sporting environment. So again, that sense of community created a safe space, that sense of belonging created a safe space for free expression of emotions. Mm -hmm. So just coming back to like the importance of community, how does it create safety for us to be able to express ourselves when we feel like we're a part of something? We know everybody here has got the same end goal, whether it's, you know, for our team to win in this 90 minutes we've got in front of us or our society, our culture to flourish. Yeah, I think I'm gonna, <laughs> it's an interesting point because what you're saying that um, it's, a, it's a nice point you're making because it, fundamentally that team have a common goal. They're all heading in the same direction. So they can enjoy success as much as they enjoy failure, to be honest. Well, it's not but, so much enjoy failure, it's well, embrace but, each but other. To through embrace or to, to, in a sense, to get through failure, maybe. Maybe Absolutely. to experience failure. Too. So, so and, and that's why, you know, there's, there's nothing better than a team that's working well, but there's nothing more destructive than, dis, than a dysfunctional team. So by the same token, in a work context or business context there, you know, the community itself doesn't solve things if they're not acting like a community. Exactly. So, and I think I wonder whether it's having some kind of common purpose. So if you are a little a business leader or a team leader, you know, it's all very well saying we're a community here. But if you haven't got the same common purpose, then mental health will not necessarily be, be, be will flourish at the same time. The powerful point there, Mark, you can have a team of extraordinary athletes but if they don't work as a team, it's pointless. Right. Equally, you can have a team of, you know, relatively average athletes, but they function as a team. Yeah. And then you've got a Leicester winning the, 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 right. the, the title or a Greece right. winning the Euros or a Denmark right. winning the Euros. But also you can have a team of fantastic individuals and they'll be like Manchester United this yeah. season. And they will amount to nothing. Uh, apologies for our fans in the okay. US. We're talking about actual real and This is not fair on my list from the States. These are the teams. <laughs> We're talking about Excuse actual me. real football. <laughs> Hold on. Let's not forget I lived in the UK for three years, so I'm, <laughs> okay, I'm not okay, this like okay, random okay, American, okay? okay. <laughs> well, well, I, I should also yeah. flag up that we, we have a, probably about 40% of our viewers that are in the US as well. So uh, I, I'm hoping some of these analogies will carry. But again, so, you know, from your perspective, you, you know, coming back to this sense of like community of everybody singing the same song, cheering for the same outcome. How is that? In, well, why is that important? And how is that a powerful antidote? To what we're currently experiencing well you can sing the same song if everybody else singing it but if you have a different song you're not allowed to sing it and you're going to be cancelled how you know why why is it important that we start to foster this sense of of, of belonging community and putting in the same direction so i'm going to go a bit deeper here amazing please do <laughs> spoken like a true form of therapist <laughs> yeah, right. what i feel is truly missing at the base of it all is trust. I do. Trust is a serious problem for the average person for a whole smorgasbord of reasons. So if we're thinking, and this is no offense to the football example, but if we're thinking about typical circles of people, families, other types of communities, the workplace, trust, is something that for some people is very, very tough to give and for others very tough to earn. So it's hard to champion a similar purpose if there's an absence of trust. And on top of that, to be very realistic and very honest, there are still many people who don't feel the need to sing the song at all and don't even know why the song exists. So I wish, I wish I could say, and I don't mean to sound nihilistic or negative, that someday this will be something that every single person on the planet will care about, but we can't guarantee that. We just can't. 
there are people that no joke have messaged me privately saying what you're doing is complete um horse bleep i didn't think i could curse on this recording you can do whatever you want so feel free Express oh, I, said, what, what, I get i get people messaging me bleep? saying uh no, i get people i get yeah. i'm trying to answer your question mm. i i get people who message me occasionally saying what you do is total horseshit it's not real it's not real and there's always a reason behind that there is always a, an experience a motivation and something that makes them arrive at that decision so i think that while i would love that the entire nar narrative would shift globally that i think there is an absence of trust and i think that not everybody is motivated or ready or sees the purpose of doing this or sees that it's actually a real issue. So there's a lot of optics that need to be shifted around that, obviously, but I think there's also a lack of trust of the, of the other, and we're very good at othering each other. Mm -hmm. well, Mal, would you, to be clear, what do you mean by a lack of trust? A lack of trust in what? So you have to have trust to be able to talk about mental health with another human being. If you don't have trust, the fear is they'll judge me. They won't understand. They just can't get it. They'll tell what I'm saying to other people. If there's no trust, people are not gonna open up about something that's already difficult to talk about. Yeah, I would add to that. Like for, for us, I'd, I'd go probably a little bit broader. It's feeling safe. Um, it, it's not a safe mm -hmm. subject. There's fear of judgment, of, yeah. of the impact it will have on your, your life, how you'll be viewed. You know, the, the, there are still phrases that we, we use, like grown men don't cry, soldier on, pull your socks up and get on with them. Yeah, these are all hangovers from the Second World War. A lot of people don't appreciate the true origins of these phrases. There was a period where we needed to do that. But actually, the people that soldier on, pull their socks up and get on with it and don't cry, mm -hmm. don't express themselves are sadly likely to become the statistics that we've been talking about at the earlier part of this discussion. And I think I'd like to, to ensure that we leave this on a positive note and, and to consider, well, where has it gone right? You know, in your experience, have you got examples of communities or environments you found yourself where they have built that song, strong sense of, of, of community, where there is trust, where people feel safe, where they're able to express themselves, they're supporting each other. And it could be sort of micro, it could be micro, it could be a company or, a, uh, you know, a local geographic region, or it could be even broader. So, have you even I've got one, one actually, but it's a great. I got one one example. If I could just just um, just go first, it was linked to a friend of mine who has been struggling with mental health a little bit in his corporate environment, and he said that uh, he had this amazing meeting, like a Zoom call meeting with this team, and the boss who historically was a kind of bit of a cold fish, you know, a bit of a kind of, let's get on with the agenda today. We've got to cover eight, eight points. The boss started the meeting with a, it's a Monday morning, everyone, welcome. Uh, I just like to say I had a really difficult weekend this weekend. You know, this weekend I, I struggled a bit uh, with my mental health because blah, 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 blah. And there was this like tumbleweed moment where people couldn't quite believe what they were hearing. And he said, and how, how have your weekends been? <laughs> it was like, and all of a sudden, people just started to talk about their weekends and like, and in a, in a, in a very truthful, honest way. And my friend was just saying it just liberated the entire group because going back to Melissa, what you said about trust. Here was the boss, the main, the main person in the group, saying, "I struggled this weekend," and he never said it in the past. And suddenly, the floodgates opened, and it felt like a really good thing to start the week with. So that was the sort of one thing where the sort of senior bod in the group sets the ball rolling in the mental health area. I thought it was a lovely example. Oh, fantastic. Mm. Yeah. So I have been seeing that obviously in the companies I'm working with, and I always insist, no mm. matter what type of event I'm doing, there has to be multiple faces from within the organization who are helping to shape the narrative around that event. I can't just come in where these folks don't know me from Adam and start talking about mental health without some form of facilitated conversation from people from their own community. That is very intentional. And so what I would actually say is even on a larger scale, 
the most incredible sense of community that I have seen just championing this in such an incredible way is on LinkedIn. And I, I have found the most incredible people that I would consider to be my community on LinkedIn, people who I've never met in person, never. And now that things are like slightly opening up and I'm starting to meet these people in, in person, they have so positively impacted my life, my career, my everything. And I've never shaken their hand ever. And I got to meet one of them uh, actually a couple of days ago. She was in town speaking at a conference. She endorsed my book. I had never even met the woman. And we have been corresponding for two years. And when I hugged her two days ago, it was like I had known her for an eternity. And LinkedIn, for me individually, I have just seen the most incredible tribe around mental health and mental health at work in the most desperately needed way. Mm. And I think it just depends where you turn your attention. I, uh, that's how you can find different communities. No, I totally agree. And it's that there's always wonderful examples of things that are going well but sadly mainstream media and social media seems to be filled with stories and cases of where it goes wrong and you know if we judge human society on what we see online you might you know particularly with a lot of the stuff that's shared on mainstream media and social media you get a pretty dark perspective on humanity but it's not true i've got plenty of examples of wonderful compassionate empathetic human beings that really genuinely want to make a difference and as we start sharing these stories we start to realize actually there is there is plenty of positive examples out there and a, a great example that i'd like to offer is um we started working with our biggest client at the moment is philips uh, the electronics company um we're working with them globally uh, we launched a program uh, with the intention of training up 5,000 mental health champions so we only started that program um, about seven or eight months ago. We're well into that. We've got champions trained from West Coast America all the way through to New Zealand going east. So we're pretty much covering the globe. And over the last few months, whenever there's been a tragedy or a challenge, they've always put their hands up from that mental health champions community to say, well, what can we do? So they've basically become pretty much the, the first responders. When... Um, uh, the, 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 the events started to transpire in, in, in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine. Uh, they've got a lot of colleagues in, in Central and Eastern Europe and, and Russia. They all put their hands up and said, what can we do? How can we get involved and support the people that are going through a tough time, even if it's just to be a friendly colleague, to have that conversation? And it really kind of reaffirmed the goodness in humanity. There are good people out there that want to be able to do something, that want to be able to make a difference. And exactly coming back to, to Mel's point, as we start to feel safe and, and we trust the people around us and we trust that not everybody's out to, to get ahead by, by jumping on, on, on your head to get up, I think we start to really understand that we will only flourish and thrive if we're able to come together as a society and as, as a community. So I wish we had more time. I think there's definitely enough opportunity for us to do several more of these. Um, but um, I, just a, a final point. So, Mel, your book once again is called "Yes, You Can Talk About Mental Health at Work." Here's why. I assume you can get this in all good bookshops. Yes, it is available across all major online retailers and some brick and mortar stores. Uh, available all across the planet. And Mike, beat stress at work. Um, where can people get hold of that, Mark? Uh, ditto. I mean, Mel said it basically. Yeah, same places. Hopefully, yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here with us, supporting Stress Awareness Month this year and reaffirming the need for us to build strong, robust communities where we can start protecting the most vulnerable members of our society. And it was as Mahatma Gandhi said, that's how we judge our society, by how we protect and treat the most vulnerable members. At the moment, we've been failing, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. There is hope. And I hope people can take something from our conversation to consider what they can do to start building stronger communities in their local areas, in their families, or in their workplaces. Wishing you all the best. Remember, there's lots of free resources on our website, stress.org.uk. Check it out, and we'll put, to, put, put some further information about the books there as well. Have a wonderful day, and see you on the next one.